Hello everyone, I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about Hepatopulmonary Syndrome. Hepatopulmonary Syndrome is defined as an age-corrected and widened alveolar arterial oxygen gradient with or without hypoxemia and this is due to intrapulmonary vasodilatation. So there is desaturation and this is due to intrapulmonary vasodilatation. The pathophysiology of hepatopulmonary syndrome begins in a patient with cirrhosis and portal hypertension who also has inflammation and vasoactive mediators in the serum. This results in inflammation and injury of the hepatocyte or cholangiocyte along with increased transforming growth factor beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. This along with endothelial nitric oxide synthetase and vascular endothelial growth factor mediators along with monocytes adhesion and activation results in arterial vasodilatation as already shown, hypoxemia which ultimately results in hepatopulmonary syndrome. The clinical features of hepatopulmonary syndrome are unique. A patient in supine position feels fine, however, when a patient with hepatopulmonary syndrome assumes a standing position, he feels breathless on standing and dyspnea while standing is called platypnea. Also, the patient desaturates in a standing position and develops cyanosis and this condition is called orthodeoxia. On assuming standing position, there is increased gravity dependent intrapulmonary shunting. I repeat, on assuming standing position, there is increased gravity dependent intrapulmonary shunting resulting in platypnea which is dyspnea on assuming a standing position and orthodeoxia. So the clinical features include dyspnea, clubbing, distal cyanosis and in some patients there can also be cough. The severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome can be graded based on the arterial oxygen Partial pressure in a patient with a PaO2 of more than 80 is known to have mild. A patient with a PaO2 of between 60 and 80 millimeters of mercury is said to have moderate. And a patient with PaO2 of between 50 and 60 is said to have severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. And patients with a PaO2 of less than 50 are said to have very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. The diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome requires a high degree of clinical suspicion and involves arterial oxygen saturation monitoring. We can also go in for detection of intrapulmonary shunting. Let us now take a look at the technique for diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome. This is a jar of or a bottle of saline which is agitated or shaken from side to side resulting in the formation of these bubbles as shown here. These bubbles are now injected into the vein of the patient. The bubbles are now in the vein of the patient. Now, let us orient ourselves with this diagram. This is the superior vena cava, this is the inferior vena cava, this is the right atrium as labeled and the other chambers are labeled as well. Now, in a normal individual, when the bubbles reach the inferior or superior vena cava, they would reach the heart on the right side and from the heart, they would go through the pulmonary artery to the lungs where they would get absorbed in the lung. In a patient with intrapulmonary shunting, when the bubbles reach the right side of the heart, they would travel this intrapulmonary shunt and show up on the left side of the heart if there are bubbles on the left side of the heart in more than three but less than six cardiac cycles, then this is diagnostic of hepatopulmonary syndrome. That is, between three and six cardiac cycles, if the bubbles appear on the left side of the heart, this is diagnostic of the intrapulmonary shunting as shown here and this is diagnostic of hepatopulmonary syndrome. If the bubbles reach the left side of the heart in less than three cycles, then this means that there is an intracardiac shunt and this generally means an atrial septal defect. This flowchart represents a means to diagnose hepatopulmonary syndrome based on oxygen saturation. If the oxygen saturation is more than 96%, it is unlikely that the patient has hepatopulmonary syndrome. If the saturation is less than 
96%, then the patient can undergo a contrast transthoracic echocardiogram, the contrast being agitated air bubbles, as we have just seen. If the test is positive and we have excluded lung disease and we have done arterial blood gases, then a diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome is established. However, if the test is negative, then the patient does not have hepatopulmonary syndrome. So, the investigative modality would be a contrast transthoracic echocardiogram, the contrast being air bubbles. Let us now take a look at the management options in hepatopulmonary syndrome. These include medical therapy. There have been some anecdotal reports that garlic can improve symptoms in hepatopulmonary syndrome. However, we cannot recommend it at this point. Pentoxifilin has some role in the treatment of HPS. Interventional radiology procedures such as the TIPS procedure and pulmonary embolization also have a role and finally the definitive treatment for hepatopulmonary syndrome is liver transplant. Severe hypoxemia is a mild exception in that patients who have hypoxemia get priority over others for liver transplant and 85% of patients will improve after liver transplant the improvement would be in their symptoms of hepatopulmonary syndrome, although this may take up to one year. Let us just take a look at a diagrammatic representation of the TIPS procedure. This is the splenic vein, this is the superior mesenteric vein, and this is the portal vein. This is the inferior vena cava. In the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, there is a direct connection between the portal vein and the IVC, thereby bypassing the obstruction caused by cirrhosis. Finally, a pulmonary angiography and embolization, as already discussed, is one of the interventional radiologic technique in the management of hepatopulmonary syndrome, and this embolus so introduced would reduce the intrapulmonary shunts. That's it for our video on hepatopulmonary syndrome. We will see you in the next presentation.